little bit about Eileen. Eileen is a painter and with a very strong foundation in drawing and mixed media. And you can think of pretty much any kind of wet or dry medium. And Eileen has experimented with it. And a lot of it we can see here. Everything from charcoal to pencil to colored pencils to Conti crayons to watercolor, oil, spray paint, acrylic paint, of course, and every combination thereof. Eileen has been creating work um, at a professional level for more than 45 years. Um, and she's experimented with many media, media. And we're seeing sort of the apex of everything coming together for this long career here today in, in this exhibition. Um, Eileen has also participated in many uh, prestigious art residencies, including the Atlantic Center for the Arts in Florida, uh, the um, Watermill Center, um, the uh, School of Visual Arts, and uh, the John North or Shoshana residency, which is where we met, where we bonded in like about 15 seconds. Uh, <laughs> and when was and that? When was that? That was in 2021, right on the heels of the pandemic. We ripped our masks off within about an hour. I said, we, we don't have to wear this, do we? <laughs> we shared a house together. We shared a house together. We, we, we toured it. Well, we'll get into that a little bit as we you know, get into the interview, that um, it's a real honor to be able to interview a really good friend. I really, um, we're really close, so anybody who thinks that they're Eileen's best friend, um, I'm Eileen's <laughs> best friend. So just to sort of throw it out there, um, Eileen has also participated, her, her work has been exhibited extensively, and an exciting project that she recently did was a 30-foot drawing on the beach as part of uh, Warren Needick's Swept Away uh, exhibition. Um, my name is Stephen Rudin. I'm a uh, uh, collage artist and art educator and uh, psychiatrist. And um, I thought, Eileen often calls me up and she tells me, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And then she says to me afterwards, um, I just wanted to run that by my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Eileen is my doctor. I'm just waiting for a billing statement. So Eileen, <laughs> you know, hopefully she, she's going to give me some extra time. So again, welcome to everybody, and we're going to talk about the exhibition. So maybe we'll just start with some basic overview. Like I said, it's a real treat to have an artist present, to be able to sort of give us a sneak peek behind what goes into the work, but also to hear from you in your own words. If you could just describe the exhibition for us in your own words. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Some of my dearest, sweetest friends are here. And thank you, Sozita, and the opening gallery, and of course, Stephen Rudin for saying yes, because I trust you very much. Uh, what we're seeing are eight canvases, paintings on canvas, and six paintings on paper. And they are the framed ones under glass. And they are, they are of bodies and toys and lines and color and mass and form and much more, much more, I really prefer always the viewer to decipher what they're truly about. So I think that's a really important point is that when we think of visual art, we think a lot of times as a, a visual narrative. And although these works have titles, um, in the past I know that you've also not used titles, that you've used the word untitled. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to tell a story and with visual storytelling without words, maybe with or without words? Uh, um, the narrative, in, for me, in general, is uh, something I have to think deeply about. Uh, I, I prefer the, a flat plane where I fuse several of the planes together. I consider myself to always traditionally a, pop, a very contemporary pop type artist, even though I'm not pop one would think, like Andy Warhol or Roy Lichtenstein. But um, I'm of that world. You know, I was, was trained with the, um, you know, classically, you know, we always had to look at Rembrandt's and copy Cezanne's apples and pears forever, but um, Picasso really broke the mold for the most artists in the um, 20th century. And we had to, in, in my education, we had to learn that one continuous line drawing. And it's taken me years to um, be more free, even though I've painted like this, maybe not with the models, but in these lines, blocks of colors, almost continuously, but to be open and free, it takes me a long time. I, uh, my, two of my models are here, and they know I start, they tend to start tight and traditional, representational, for me, representational, 
and it takes, like with Gigi, it took about nine months to become free, really open, and where you know the body is sort of showing, but maybe it's not. So I think that that brings up a point. Like sometimes people say to me as an artist, they say, "Oh, you know, you make art. That must be so relaxing." <laughs> 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 and I think that art is really like about sort of the agony and the ecstasy and. Even that you're bringing up the point that you really experimented for nine months before you got to the point where you even started this series. Is, is that accurate? It is. I was working on another series at the time. Um, I wasn't thrilled with it, and so I, but, I, but I wanted to stay somewhat in the story of it. And that's when I had met um, Gigi at a bookmaking class, and I overheard them say, Oh, I modeled for these men uptown, and I thought, ooh, that's an awful experience. <laughs> you know, like, imagine what that's about. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the drinking and the drooling and the drawing. So I, um, I asked them, would they model privately? And, and we slowly started a conversation. And I, I've looked at some of the earlier paintings, completely different than where we ended up and, and trusting each other. Because it's a matter of trust. I mean, they didn't know me, and they came to you know, this woman's like studio, a loft, filthy place. I gave them some sort of phone to sit on, and you know, got naked. <laughs> I said, don't worry, we're going to feed you lunch. I did. <laughs> so, um, I, it, but it's not, there's nothing relaxing about it. I have um, a tremendous amount of anxiety. I, we've talked about that aha moment where if things are sort of coming in together. I don't have, I rarely have those or understand I'm having them while I'm working because when I'm working, if it's going right, I'm deep within it. Uh, if I'm, I think if I'm just sitting down and looking at the canvas and paper and I have that blank, whether there's lines up there already, you have those, I can have a couple of days where I'm absorbing it, but I'm not actively working because I'm petrified. And then I overeat and I make seven cups of tea and I have a lot of chocolate. But it's, um, it's really frightening and it's physically demanding what making this work. Yeah, you can see that and I've seen you, you know, we were in a residency together and we've done open studios together and I've seen you work and, you know, you're not just standing in front of the canvas, you're lifting, you even sometimes work on the floor, don't you? Because gravity is not your friend. I mean, unless you're using really thick impasto paint, you know, it just starts to fall. Um, no, I, we, we have to thank the mid-19th century artists in America who came up with that whole thing, let's put it on the floor. And it wasn't just as we think Jackson Pollock, there were other ones. And I'm sure there were painters in 1525 down, you know, let's, let's put it down because there's things you have to do when, it, when it's down. Maybe you don't talk about it, but painting on the floor, I can only do certain things on the floor. Because you, even if it's abstracted, the human, we're looking at it, so it has to, I work, even though I did say that I, I find myself more of a flat, could pop contemporary artists, I always want to make, allow the viewer to feel they can step into the canvas, they feel they can walk around the body or the tree or whatever I've done or the owl. And that has to do with the way we look at things. So I always work on eye level, even when I'm drawing. I mean, Gigi knows this, Joey knows this. It's, I don't draw flat on the floor. It's only when I'm, it's something wet, very, very wet. Like you have these drips, you start them and then poof, you quickly put them on the floor. Um, a lot of people may not appreciate this, maybe they do, but to combine the materials that you're combining, the wet and the dry requires a lot of, I would call it executive functioning, basically, where you have to sequence things and time things. So, and um, and uh, some of these uh, particular kinds of uh, materials that you use don't necessarily go together, they don't necessarily cooperate. Can you tell us about some of the more interesting combinations of materials that you know that are real Eileen Oking and Kornreich sort of uh, alchemy? Well, it the these 
high texture paintings are a result of if I went back to painting in oil paints in my small studio in Brooklyn. And I executed only partial, I stopped doing it, the, the bridge series, which you know, some people here know those paintings. But the toxicity, the smell, and I, I, I worked very fast, and they weren't drying fast enough. So I worked on an idea of how, how could I give the painting the look and the texture of oil paint. And I believe I've come up pretty close to it. So it's, it took a few months of working with the company Golden that makes uh, acrylic products. And they have, a, have four different products that I wanted to use. And I've asked, you know, we went deep, because they have uh, an 800 number, an artist, four or five artists are employed. And they, for a long time, 25 years, and they really know the products well. And I wanted to use two of their products in an unorthodox way. And after several days of talking with them, I said, great. After you do it, call us back. <laughs> well, I'm not calling Golden back. You know, they can hire me. I can be one of those people. <laughs> so um, the, I use a, past, a, a pastel brown, which gives the feeling for uh, of paper somewhat on canvas. And it's designed for pastel. And I use several different materials in it and on top of it that Golden didn't bank on anyone ever be using. And one of them is oil, oil sticks. I started a couple of years ago using oil sticks on it. Um, and then I used particular acrylics to seal everything. So the, all of this is pencil and pastel. But I have to seal it. I just can't leave it up. It would just start decomposing. People would touch it, or the air. So I found another way. And I used four different ways of sealing it with, with sprays and then paint sealers. So now they, they, for me, they give that look in my mind that there is oil paint out there. Maybe you guys don't see it, but I'm mm -hmm. pretending. No, it definitely, it makes me think of, of an idea that like, that your artist process is an indicator of your personality just as much as your content is. And so in a lot of ways I think of you as if you want to get something done, I consult with you to figure out how to get it done. Even down to the basically the customer service of getting people to get you the material. Like you've told me, for example, how you've hunted down materials yeah. really to the ends of the earth and gotten people to like go around their supervisor to sell you <laughs> prohibited contrabanded uh, materials. And I think maybe a group would want to hear about that oh, a little bit. The pandemic was great for that. There were so many you know stores that couldn't sell. And um, I'm you know, it's not a bottomless pit. You have to figure out how to, you, and you can't buy things on sale anymore. There's no stores. So I just found a way to purchase uh, materials through all these small little last, I guess last of the independent stores throughout America. And I would buy, bought their whole box of Sennelier pastels, because they were just thrilled to get rid of it. And we'd make deals. So and I didn't have to pay the tax because it was Minnesota or Milwaukee or something like that. And I got all these materials shipped to me at a fraction of what the big, you know, gorilla of Blick is, which won't give discounts. Um, I do have a paper person I have been buying from before the pandemic, um, who's a wholesaler, but and he's in another western state, and sometimes he has. And I found found them by accident, and they um, will break reams for me. And I, for instance, that black paper, they stopped making um, Arch and, and Paris just mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. like six months ago. And I bought the last, he called me up and let me know, and I bought the last 600 sheets. I already had 700 sheets of different sizes. This is a very beautiful printer's paper, so it takes water and abuse, and you can do a lot with it. Um, so they're not, it, there's an Italian company that makes it, but it's very thin. It's not the same way. This is a big, beautiful, delicious, raggy paper. And I have one uh, company in England that sells me pencils, but I, have, I buy about a thousand pencils. <laughs> because I've noticed that the colors change, not so much with paints. Sometimes you'll get a variation with paints, but colored pencils, and if you use colored pencils, you know, you think you've got that turquoise down and you need it for the painting and you order it again and it's really off. It's not the same color. Mm -hmm. So I now tend to buy like two, 
you know, 200 of one color. So that's really fascinating from a material perspective because a lot of artists, you know, very frugal with their materials. And you were telling me, how many colored pencils did you use? Well, it took three days to do that. I mean, a lot of times just stepping back, but one line, two pencils sometimes mm -hmm. because that pastel brown, I'd have to paint on top and give it more pastel brown and it just, it's a, some pum pumice or something that's in there and it just eats up the lead. So you're constantly grinding the pencil and doing, making the line again. It was like, Argh. yeah, a lot of, I gave Gigi a bunch of stubs. You, you still have them. Yeah. I have more stubs. <laughs> <laughs> You a little hand can use them. So these are the finest quality materials for sure. Yeah. You really go to the really to great lengths to, to source them. Which reminds me sort of like, you know, that a lot of us when we went to hardware stores or, or art supply stores as children, you know, sort of that feeling. And I wouldn't be true to my namesake if I didn't ask them anything about childhood. So uh -huh. um, how was art what role did art play in your family and your upbringing? Uh, a very large role. I'm number seven, ch seven child out of eight children. And my father was an artist. And uh, later, and he didn't stay a frustrated artist, even though he had to get a job in a as a businessman. Um, he, stayed, he did pencil, I mean, it was like a pen and ink, mostly. And we didn't have a look, really had no money whatsoever. And that was our form of painting and, and drawing. Um, pencils, I think, were beyond our scope of ink lasts a long time, and if you figure out the quill, it was great. And then when I was about, well, before I was born, he picked up a, some left, uh, old used cameras. There were a two by, like a two by three and a four by five camera, and he would shoot all year, and then develop them around January, the, the uh, negatives. And then February, close our one bathroom for 10 people early and mm. tell everyone, that's it, because that was the dark room. And as you got older and you were good enough, or you were interested enough, you got to work in that dark room, that bathroom with him, which was fascinating, because then I got to learn all about printing, especially silver prints. And I was telling Stephen how we would store all the chemicals in the kitchen, and we had this old Victorian house with this high, high, cabinets, glass cabinets, and there was a little sign, keep out, like, <laughs> and, you know, because that was how we grew up, and we understood. I have a brother who's a really good photographer, but, you know, in photography, I was decent-ish, but not, I'm, you know, you have to pay attention, you have to do math with photography, and I wasn't interested in that. But drawing, I was really encouraged to do a lot of art. I'm thinking about the idea that you're the seventh of eight children, and how at the top of the cabinet there was a label that said do not touch before you could read. Right, it was skull and feet and the skull and crossbow. <laughs> but you were also, you also uh, continued in, in high school, didn't you go to a special program? Yes, I did. Um, I, my, it was the 70s, early 70s, and everyone was experimenting with, uh, in public school systems, alternative ways to teach. And I was um, chosen to be, um, in this independent studies program. So I spent three quarters of my last year, my senior year in high school, in this program, which was just fantastic. I got to meet professional artists in and around even upstate New York, uh, where I hitchhiked up to Woodstock to meet a well-known artist. And I had a hard time getting back home. I didn't realize it would get dark. Um, but it really <laughs> opened, opened up my eyes about people could make a living. And if it also was a new school, and I was in a part of a busing, you know, you know the bus kids from the, I was living in the inner part of the city. And I got to go to this fabulous campus where one building was just for the arts. And they had a printing press, and we were the first graduating class. So it was, it, I was a kid with a, a veteran than a candy shop. I just made art all the time, and, and, and good, decent art. So that's that was impressive. Well, that was this, you know the last of, this, you know, I brought people to, I played the clarinet for six years terribly, but I played the clarinet. You know, everyone had to have an instrument. We, in my family, we had to do things to, we didn't have a TV until it was about seven or eight. So we had to keep busy. Independently. Independently keep busy. Yeah. yeah Which is something you can do now, obviously. Independently. Yep. It was really great. Do you have a 
favorite piece of artwork from childhood that you can remember? Well, my favorite, like in childhood, little any, childhood? Any, you know, open it up. I guess, you know, I was, my best friend in his, like second grade, Mary Beth Cohn and I, would draw the Flintstones that were new on TV. <laughs> the whole concept that you could draw these people with these square legs and flat feet with round rocks, and then they were blown out of the air with Sonny and Cher came on TV. <laughs> and, you know, she was so sexy and he wore those fur shirts. I think I'm still with the foxtail doing that line. And I drew them for about two or three, whenever they were on TV, I just sat in front of it and I drew them. They were very fascinating to me. But that's like little kid stuff, you know, but later, you know, there's all these other very interesting works. Well, I believe it all goes in there. You know, we, we sort of, get, over the course of our lives, we gather these skills. And as artists, we're able to just use them, you know. I, I was thinking recently that I was telling my partner that I made a embroidery, um, you know, when I was like in fourth grade. He said, oh, was it a square six by six? And I said, yeah, he said, we did that too. So, you know, we, we have memories of those, of those sorts of things. Back to the show um, a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit, you know, one of the things I've heard you say in the past is that, you know, that you really would like to be an abstract painter, but I find that this show is very grounded in portraiture. It is. I would love to do pure abstract work, and I do. I have like little series. Um, no one, people don't see them. I mean, people hardly see my work at all. So um, I do them, and to me it's like um, cleansing the palate with sorbet when I'm frustrated. Or, or the beginning of a series, I'll just start doing line drawings and line drawings, and I'll do um, scroll, lots of what I call scroll drawings, and run up like eight pages of it, and mostly there are complete abstraction. Um, but I am drawn to figurative work. Like I haven't painted a human, painted a human body in about 30 years. I've drawn them. I got very tired of it. Uh, for a while, and this brought me to, I was drawing and painting a female body for a while, and then I met Gigi, and they, they, I changed. Tell us about how you set that up, because we, we'd like to imagine, like, what it requires, you know, we come to see an art show, we, and we see it already finished, but a lot goes into that. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you set that up, and what a typical sort of maybe a typical session with uh, with one of your because a few of your models are here actually but yeah. but what with with what a typical session would look like? Well, I always see them looking disappointed because <laughs> they think I'm going to sit there and draw them. Joey said the first time, "Does it look like me?" <laughs> and so and Joey's come at the end of where I was doing a little more realistic, and then sometimes I did do, I have one almost Picasso-like line drawing of Gigi, that was like, finally for me, okay, that's the last time we're gonna do that type of drawing, and then I'm gonna go into more painting. So I do work with Conti crayon or pastel or pencil in a very loose, fast method, and then I might, I'll probably do 10 of them and I'll tell them to slow down. We're just going to do one. And I don't like, I, I love these two people in my life because they're not professional models. They don't have that stiffness and that, you know, kind of sulky or they're going to do that pose that's just mm -hmm. done forever. They'll do anything or what I feel their bodies can do. With, with Joey, it's mostly just sit down in that chair, except when I, had to pretend he was writing a lion. That was a very special moment. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yes, you remember. Remind us of the you title are, of this you, piece. Oh, this is the the amphetamine elf rides a lion, <laughs> and I got that line amphetamine elf from Lou Reed, as you know, he was friends with Billy Cornrush, my late husband, and maybe 20 years ago we were on Bleecker Street, and Billy and Lou were visiting this man who's called the Calypso King, and good friends with hers, and I met them outside, and they, um, I don't know, they were talking about an old love for a friend of uh, Lou's, and Lou described coming home from a tour, 
and his entire apartment, I think it was on Bleecker Street, was covered from like ceiling to floor with writing, gibberish writing and magic marker. And he said, oh, it looks like the amphetamine elves were here. <laughs> and so that line and his voice always stuck in my head. And I was looking at this painting. And uh, getting back to you asking, that I do usually un untitle my works with just something connected, like GG series or whatever. But I thought the paintings really had a narrative to them, and that I could give them a line or two. And this one, I thought, oh, this is like someone going to an ecstasy, ecstasy club, like they're taking speed or something, and they're dancing all night, and the butterflies are going in their head. And um, so I that saying just popped in my head. I said, that's it. That's why I'm going to give it to them. That makes me think of surrealism. Um, a little bit, and I'm interested in surrealism in particular because of the relationship of early psychoanalysis and surrealism. And, uh, and one of the aspects of surrealism that's important is the juxtaposition of elements that don't necessarily go together. And there is a lot of that in this work. Could you talk a little bit about that a little bit? Well, it's interesting that surrealism took all that work that's been done mostly by popes or had Pope's had work done. So also you have a you have this this little floating baby with wings and really it's an old man posing or you know a teenager. The face is not a baby, right? And what is that cherub doing there? What why is it in a Watteau? Why why are you know the the clown and you know the harlequin look trying to seduce a woman and like they're supposed to be a, their version of a nightclub and this poop is floating around. It doesn't, it's very surrealistic. And then we had formalistic surrealism. And then it got really wacky when we had, like by the late 70s, like Sigmar Polk, he was really one of the first to start having things floating around that don't make any sense. And um, David Sally, like, you know, hanging a chair in front of a painting. Mm -hmm. that's, very surrealistic. So um, people do do it. Uh, artists do that that look. Um, I still believe things need to have a little bit of make sense, though I'm starting to use um, stencils and uh, with characters, and I'm very careful about that. Yeah, so the piece that's in the back here is an example of that, right? There's a stencil on the back, right? And um, and that's really exquisite use of color. I absolutely love that red and pink together. And, and then the, the, the Eileen O'Kane Cornrush sort of signature form making with those lines of all those different media. Maybe, um, well, Mike, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what's in that piece, just from a physical standpoint, because there's, there's a lot of different things going on. Yes, well, the name of that painting is Princesses, because Gigi. You can be quite a princess, <laughs> um, and that is a, um, a, a use. The, the pose is from a, many David Sally poses, and I really adore that pose. It's, it's it shows the body as it is, this mass and form twist. It's a very hard pose to do, and I wanted that person in the painting, you have a feeling of sort of floating in space. And I've given the space, like leaving the chair unpainted, leaving part of the, the rump of the model unpainted, the hair unpainted with holes that you can put your hand right through. And then washes, and the washes are really shadows that were happening in the studio. And that was my first time I used a stencil. I had on other paintings, there's that other uh, depiction in the back where it has the little floating um, daisy duck in it. That's freehand drawn. But I've been wanting for about five years to use silk screen. It did give me a little hard edge, but silk screen is messy. And then the pandemic happened, and the person I could work with, you know, just couldn't work out. And recently I came up with the idea let me just use stencils. Uh, the baker, I, I worked as a chef on over the years, and we used stencils over cakes, like of you know, Daddy Duck for some kid party. So I had a few stencils, 
and I use it, I like the hard edge of it. And using the little drips and dots, it's trying to give it a little fantasy. Like we are not really in this hard studio that's model is not really holding that chair. It's not, it is sort of floating in space. And in their dreams, everyone's dreams, they can be a princess. And Snow White is, what, what's better than 1937 Snow White? <laughs> not much. Um, can you tell us a little bit also about um, the title of the, of the exhibition, Pleasures of Duality? Well, for many of us, um, well, some of us, uh, they are very vested in and, and feel very comfortable in duality in many aspects of their lives. I have, um, on any given hour, a very different person, one moment to one person, and then I go into a bank and I'm a very different person to that. I speak to my accountant, I'm really a different person compared to when I'm speaking with you. Thank you. <laughs> or with Chi Chi, or you know, my seven-year-old grandson. I'm like a completely different person. So I feel we all, I do definitely embody many different dualities. And maybe more, I don't know the term for multiples. And the painting in the back of the wide open box with a blue background, with the legs, those cartoonish legs, that was first titled Pressures of Duality. I've, um, I know, I have a brother who's schizo-bipolar and I know he has a lot of pressure with that. And so I just thought that that could be a, a, a decent title. Mm -hmm. And then Sozita asked me for a title for the show, I don't know, really? <laughs> My God, I have to think of everything in here. I, I, so I just thought um, the pleasures of duality because I do find most of these paintings happy. They're even the one with the big wolf about to maybe maybe chop that legs off or just be some fantasy. It's a really happy blue back there. It's it's a nice painting. Yeah, none of them are scary, or at least to me. No, they're, I think that they're very talented. Um, but also the, your concept about the idea of pleasures of duality, I think, <laughs> is really timely. Because, um, you know, a lot of times we think of duality as, you know, different aspects of, of, of the world in conflict with each other. But you're really showing a harmonization, mm -hmm. sort of surrendering to the idea that, like, that you can paint on paper, you can draw on canvas, you can use stencils, you can use any combination of things, and they can work together. But it takes work to make them to work together. You have to sort of, you know, release the expectation that they're not going to work and sort of surrender to the pleasure of the duality. I think that's a really wonderful, wonderful, very hopeful idea. Um, so maybe I thought we'd open this up now um, um, to some questions. We'll take three questions in the interest of time. Does anybody have any questions for Eileen? I do. Yes. I've known you for a long time, and it was not until in the last several years that I realized that you were a serious artist. And I can't figure out why I didn't know that in those that other decade or two that I knew you. Because there was a while that you um, sat on that part of yourself. Or am I wrong? Or were you doing it and I was oblivious? Or, or what? Well, art takes a long time to make. Yeah. Good art and bad art, both of them. <laughs> it takes a long time. Um, what can take me, and you know, for 40 minutes or the other one on top was longer, uh, maybe a couple of days, I would go back and forth with it. Um, but it also took 47 years and yeah, 40 I'm with the hours. Big, the big span of time. Well, I've always made art, I always drew. No one asked. In the nineties and the always, I've always always been. It was very quiet. Yeah, I have the show because Sozita asked me. Oh. It's very hard to get attention, especially as a female artist. Very very hard. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's almost impossible, especially my age group. <coughs> there were maybe who started out. At, my age, who con were continued, 
um, most of them taught. Really, there's, who has a big career is only Amy Stillman, I can think of. And she, we go back, you really don't see anything earlier than like 97. But on 10th Street, did you have a place where you made art? Yeah. I didn't know about that. No one asked. No one I did tell people I was an artist, but no one said, hey, can I go see your work? But that's okay, because I'm here now. Like, this is really good work. Mm. So, yes. There's a question that I have. Is there a painting here that means the most to you in terms of what you learned or what you experienced in um, hmm. What painting means the most to me? Uh, actually, I really adore each one of them. It, it happens. Every time I make a painting, I go, oh, I love this. And then I'll maybe put it away. Ugh. Ooh, do I really want to show that? Um, and I have hundreds of paintings that I would probably would, uh, I would be petrified to show. Hmm. But it doesn't mean they're, they're probably fabulous. You know, I just, so, um, I, I, I'm trying to have that in my head. I, I, I think, um, Using stencils and using spray paint is very new for me. Really, really new. So I think uh, <coughs> with with probably this one here that's um, was successful the way I, I did. You know, I'm not showing the whole stencil. I don't want it. I I don't like um, call outs. I, I, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine uh, where artists will paint famous people or. You, you know, use cartoon characters that are, you know, in the, in the know. It's just, but that's a weird thing of mine, because that, Minnie Mouse is actually standing in for something. I, I don't know. I mean, I really love the hair on the doll. <laughs> I love the hair on the doll. But I also love princesses. You know, I really, really love it. I'm so positively, impressed and I've been looking at your work and how it's grown and developed and especially I love your drawing and the looseness and the power of it. I just think it's really, really exciting and also you're very good really, really good with color. And um, I think you did a really, you know, I think it, the work is really, really grown a lot. And it's getting more and more, as they say, strong, you know. Can we and a fourth question to, sure, yes, yes. to see, see how this dialogue was formulated between the two of you, and maybe Zizi can also uh, wait. What, was it, what is the question? How, how did you formulate this dialogue between Zizi and you, uh, between the you know the painter and the subject of the painting, and how it was it was it for him as well? I can start if you want. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. I think a lot about our dynamic as two very different people in this world with very different experiences um, as an older woman, as a younger non-binary, both artists, both occupying different structures of power as like me being a young artist wanting to learn from a very talented older artist in different power structures of like, oh, I have as you can see, male privilege. It's like it's it's coming out through my body. But I also have like hidden features of this other fluid gender thing where like I feel sometimes often afraid to express that in front of particularly older people. Mm -hmm. That's just a really common thing that I'm just like, oh, what if they don't get it? There's not really anything to get here. But with Eileen. What feels so validating, much more than words, is that Eileen sees me. 
It's incredible. So many people have drawn me accurately, the body accurately, but I don't look at it and go, oh, you've captured me. Unlike with Eileen's work, when I look at it, I go, oh my god, that is a piece of me. Like, you, anyone can like take the photo in their brain and put it on the paper with enough talent, but you have to want to see me. And Eileen wants to see me, and I feel that desire. And in that way, we, I feel like we are collaborating. I'm not just sitting there. And that is a beautiful experience. It makes me want to keep working. Your ass is not that big. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and I've done lots of those. Lots of those. That's one of Brooke Rebrook's role is ones on paper, those big, I have these big 40 inch, my 50 inch of that pose just in the sepia and stuff. And you, yeah, you're kind of saying, oh, my ass isn't that big. <laughs> but it was really in my face. So, um, yeah, no, working with. Gigi and Joey, completely different person, completely different body. You would never thought, think in a million years you someone would ask you to pose as, as an artist model. No. You got scared. You said, oh, I said, no, I want you to leave your boxer shorts on and do you have some nice socks. You said, oh, I worked in a shoe store. Yes, I do. <laughs> and so you showed up. And it's the dialogue. We, we talk. Gigi, before you got in that pose, we went through all the David Sally paintings, and I said, have you ever seen this artist? And look at her face, she looks scared. She's, this one, she's stressed. We're, not, we're gonna cut that out, we're not gonna have that look. I don't want that look, and that, oh, except my subjectivity, the orange one back there. That was a very hard, hard pose. That was a, it's a horrible pose. You're on the edge of a chair, and you could just, very different than the original model. So yeah, you get very close. And we, I, I ask you to hold a pose just five minutes, you know, not 15 minutes, because it's too. It's, all those poses too hard. Even the Gauguin pose, the twisted body, you didn't realize how hard that was. So that's going to be a hard pose. That little girl, that wife of his, looks in pain and, and scared. And he is. Yeah, it's, it's a whole. It's very hard to do that pose, especially on the floor. Or, Yoga mats and towels shoved underneath them. <laughs> it's so good to be here, Eileen. Thank you, Maria. Hmm. I feel like we can talk and talk and say a lot of words and a lot of explanations about, you know, good questions to ask on how the painter paints and how the sitter sits and how we experience all of this. For me, what's been really exciting, Eileen, is something that doesn't have any words. And I don't know if it's a question of time, but I feel like these things really, these manifestations from your hand through these materials, the pencils and the colors and the experience of the sitter in front of you, it really has something that is otherworldly and ancient and mythical, and I feel like words are all unnecessary. Mm -hmm. That the way I respond to them, to your, to your dog, wolf, over there, it's so visceral and so um, unjudgeable. Um, the, this personage here comes from deep inside my experience in my dream world. This one, I don't care what the title is because he's galloping towards me with these colorful things coming out of his body. It's an experience. It's, it's like a film. I'm so I had no idea that that, and I see it now, it's a, I saw only like a wind world of red lines up there. I didn't realize it was a, it's many I had no idea. <laughs> um, this and his, his ass and his, his effort and his, it's so embedded in, in the pain and in the glory of our humanity. 
And it's, for me, that's where the seriousness that Diane is talking about comes through without saying anything. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's like drawing, it's like working the earth. And how, how can you explain or working the earth? You work it and you plant it and it comes up and it doesn't come up and there's no mm -hmm. explaining that. Well, and it's to what you're saying, what Diane asked, one of, I believe, well, I've seen it after all these decades, the best work comes from artists who work, make art for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. not, I, I do, do not have the luxury of chasing a market. I'm yeah. not in the marketplace. But I owe my time. And I'm even, I will transcend time. My work is going to be really something else when it's the right, you know, group gets <laughs> all of it. Yeah. But um, I've always made artwork, some of it not great, and some of it really great. And it's, it's in storage. It's under, some went to the dump last year. I finally got rid of some. I just couldn't, it was, some of it was just the way. I, you know, I only have so much room. But um, artists who don't change, the, the middle artists, it's the ones who are younger and they're coming up and maybe they're, they did the one hit they're ever gonna make. And then the artists who are continuing to try to vacate that same one hit wonder. They're trying to do that same artwork over and over again. Mm -hmm. But the artists who make art for themselves, they can change it all the time. And the artwork does, hates, hates change. Mm -hmm. But I have the luxury to make change. Well, that's what works. That's what, yeah, to me, works. that's so, what works. So I, I it's genuine art. and it's real and there's no, it's what, it's what comes out of you and, and it's honest. And I thank you, it, it gives me uh, encouragement to be a better person. Wow, because I like it when you're bad. <laughs> <laughs>